Dearly beloved, this morning we will continue our discussion of the sacrament of penance with Lesson 30 of the Baltimore Catechism on Contrition. Last Sunday, in discussing the sacrament of penance, you will remember that we pointed out there are five conditions necessary to make a good confession, to receive the sacrament of penance worthily. First of all, we must examine our conscience. Secondly, we must have true sorrow for our sins, what we will call contrition. Third, we must have the firm purpose of not sinning again. Fourth, we must confess our sins to the priest. And fifth, we must be willing to perform the penance which the priest gives us. So these are the five conditions necessary to make a good confession. And this morning we would like to discuss the second of these five conditions, which is sorrow for sin, a very important and very necessary condition. Sorrow for sin is called contrition. Contrition is sincere sorrow for having offended God and hatred for the sins we have committed with a firm purpose of sinning no more. So you will notice that contrition includes two things. It includes sorrow, and secondly, it includes the firm purpose of amendment. You cannot say to God that you're sorry for your sins, but at the same time that you're willing to go out and commit them again. Then you're not really sorry. If you do something wrong, if you children do something wrong and your mother corrects you and you say you're sorry for it, but at the same time you say to yourself, but I'm going to do it again as soon as I can, well, then you're not really sorry. We are sorry for our sins when we are resolved not to commit them again. So contrition is very important. Without true contrition, our sins will not be forgiven. God will not forgive us any sin, whether mortal or venial, unless we have true contrition for it. All right, then, what is true contrition, or when is sorrow true contrition? Sorrow for sin is true contrition when it is interior, supernatural, supreme and universal. So in other words, there are four conditions for our sorrow to be true sorrow, true contrition. First of all, it must be interior. What does that mean? It comes from inside. It comes from our heart. In other words, we really mean it. When we tell God we are sorry, or when we go to confession and we tell the priest we are sorry for our sins, we're not just saying it. It is not simply words. We really mean it deep down inside our hearts. We really mean it when we say we are sorry for our sins. So that is what we mean when we say that sorrow is interior. The second condition is supernatural. Sorrow for sin is supernatural when, with the help of God's grace, it arises from motives which spring from faith and not from merely natural motives. Now, supposing that someone commits a crime he robs a bank or does something that's forbidden by the law and the police catch him. And this man is put in jail because he was caught doing something wrong and he's really sorry. And the reason why he is sorry is because he got caught and now he has to stay in jail. So is that contrition? Of course not. It is not contrition because his sorrow is based not on supernatural motives but simply on natural motives. Another example would be the sorrow of Judas. We read in the Bible that after Judas betrayed our Lord, he went back to the chief priests and gave the money back to them. And he said, it says in Scripture, he repented himself. In other words, he was sorry. And he told them, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. But did God forgive Judas his sin? No. Why not? Because his sorrow was not true sorrow. It was based only on natural motives. He was sorry because he felt rotten about it. He felt bad. And that's not good enough. Sorrow must be based on supernatural motives. What then are supernatural motives? An example would be sorrow for sin because mortal sin is punished in hell and venial sin is punished in purgatory. Also, sorrow for sin because it caused the death of Christ. Sorrow for sin because sin is an act of ingratitude to such a good God. Or because it is an offense against the goodness of God. All of these are supernatural motives. All of them are sufficient to give us true sorrow and thereby to have our sins forgiven. So remember that our sorrow must be interior. It comes from within, from our heart, from our mind. Secondly, it is supernatural. 
It's based on a motive of faith, the fear of hell or sorrow for sin because it offends God who is so good and we love God and we're sorrow sorry for offending him or any other supernatural motive. The third condition is that sorrow for sin must be supreme. By this we mean that we hate sin above every other evil and we are willing to endure anything rather than offend God in the future by sin. We have to be willing even to die rather than to offend God by a mortal sin. And this is what we mean by supreme. We hate sin above every other evil. We have to remember that nothing in the world, however bad, is so bad as sin. If, if you are involved in a terrible accident or you suffer some dreadful misfortune, not, none of that is as bad as committing a mortal sin, even a venial sin, but especially a mortal sin. So keep in mind that sorrow for sin is supreme when we hate sin above every other evil. Now, some people will say, well, I'm really not sure. I don't have this tremendous feeling. I don't know if I have supreme sorrow. Keep in mind that sorrow for sin is not a matter of feeling. It is rather a matter of the will, that in our mind we turn away from sin. We detest sin. We are resolved not to commit it again. We have true sorrow. It's not necessarily necessary to shed tears and to feel great grief, although that is certainly good. It's a gift from God when we have that feeling of sorrow, but it's not necessary. As long as our will turns away from sin and we are resolved not to commit it again, we hate sin above every other evil. And the fourth condition, sorrow for sin must be universal, which means that we are sorry for every mortal sin which we may have had the misfortune to commit. You cannot have some mortal sins forgiven and others remain unforgiven. Now, hopefully, you do not have any mortal sins when you go to confession. But supposing you have two or three mortal sins and you're sorry for one of them, but you're not sorry for the other one or the other ones, then none of them would for be forgiven, not even the one you're sorry for, because all of them have to be forgiven. Otherwise, it's not true contrition. True contrition is universal. That means it includes all of them. So true contrition, true sorrow, must be interior. It comes from the heart. It is supernatural, based on a motive of faith. It is supreme. Hatred of sin above every other evil, and it is universal. Sorrow for every mortal sin which we may have had the misfortune to commit. Should we always try to have sorrow for our venial sins when receiving the sacrament of penance? Very definitely, we should always try to have sorrow for our venial sins when we go to confession. And when we have only venial sins to confess, we must have sorrow for at least one of them or for some sin of our past life which we confess. It is always a good idea to confess a sin of your past life. Next Sunday, we will go into, this, into confession itself, receiving the sacrament of penance in confession. But we go to confession, we begin by saying, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. My th last confession was so many weeks ago, however long it has been. And these are my sins. And then you go on to confess your sins. And then you should end the confession of your sins by saying, I am heartily sorry for these and all the sins of my past life, especially for... And then you go on to tell one sin or maybe a couple of sins that you are especially sorry for. And that is to make sure that you have that sorrow. If you only have venial sins, sometimes it's hard to tell whether you're really sorry for them. It's a lot easier to be sorry for our mortal sins, which are so terrible. But venial sins, sometimes we don't realize how bad they are. And so it's always a good idea to confess a sin of our past life that we are very sorry for. Why should we have contrition for mortal sin? We should have contrition for mortal sin because it is the greatest of all evils. It gravely offends God. It keeps us out of heaven and condemns us forever to hell. Think about that. If you have one mortal sin on your soul and you die before going to confession, then you go to hell and you will be there forever. You will always be there if you first go to hell. A dreadful thought.
and something we must never forget. That is how terrible, how dreadful mortal sin is. And so we should have a very easy time of being sorry for our mortal sins, realizing that they are so terrible. So reflect upon the death of our Lord, that mortal sins caused his death. If there were only one mortal sin in the world and you committed it, our Lord still would have died on the cross just for that one sin. And remember also that just one mortal sin can cast you into hell for all eternity. Why should we have contrition for venial sin? We should have contrition for venial sin because it is displeasing to God. It merits temporal punishment and may lead to mortal sin. Venial sin weakens us. It makes us more vulnerable to mortal sin, more weak, we could say, easier able to fall into mortal sin. And so we should be very sorry for our venial sins as well because they displease God and we're going to have to suffer for them in purgatory if we do not make up for them in this world. Now, there are two kinds of contrition. True contrition can be either perfect contrition or imperfect contrition. Our contrition is perfect when we are sorry for our sins because sin offends God, whom we love above all things for his own sake. We are sorry for our sins because we love God. We know that God is so good that he deserves our love. And we also know that by a mortal sin, we've committed an act of hatred of God. And we detest sin because we know that God is deserving of our love, and so we realize how wicked sin is. Imperfect contrition, on the other hand, is when we are sorry for our sins because they are hateful in themselves or because we are afraid of God's punishment. So this is not as good as perfect contrition, but it's good enough. It is still true contrition. We are sorry for our sins because they place us in the danger of going to hell for all eternity. That's not perfect contrition, but it's certainly very good. That is imperfect contrition, which we also call attrition. Now, to receive the sacrament of penance worthily, what kind of contrition is sufficient? Imperfect contrition is sufficient to receive the sacrament of penance worthily. We should always try to have perfect contrition in the sacrament of penance because it is more pleasing to God, and with his help we can always have it, but still, imperfect contrition is good enough. You know, when we say the act of contrition, we make an act of both perfect and imperfect contrition. It's very possible to have both of them at the same time. And we should always try to say the act of contrition slowly and devoutly and mean both parts of it. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry for having ever offended thee. And I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. That's imperfect contrition. In other words, sorrow because we fear God's punishments. And then we go on to say, but most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and worthy of all my love. Now, that is perfect contrition. And it is very simple. If we really mean those words, we have perfect contrition. So it's very easy for us by really striving to make a good act of contrition to have both perfect and imperfect contrition at the same time. It is always good to strive to have perfect contrition, to strive to have even both of them. Now, a person who is in the state of mortal sin can regain the state of grace even before, <coughs> excuse me, even before going to confession if he has perfect contrition. If he makes an act of perfect contrition with the intention to go to confession when he is able, then his mortal sin will be forgiven. Now, he may not go to communion until he goes to confession first and confesses that sin. That's a very important condition. Just because you believe you've made an act of perfect contrition doesn't mean you can go to communion. You still have to go to confession first. But nevertheless, perfect contrition is good enough to have our sins forgiven uh, even without going to confession. But we never know for sure if we really had perfect contrition. And that's why the sacrament of penance is so very important. Then we know for sure our sins are forgiven as long as we've done our part to receive the sacrament worthily. If we have the misfortune to commit a mortal sin, we should ask God's pardon and grace at once. Make an act of perfect contrition and go to confession as soon 
as you possibly can. It is never, ever good to delay receiving the sacrament of penance. If a person is guilty of a mortal sin, or you're not sure, but you think maybe you committed a mortal sin, don't delay. Why wait? A person who is in the state of mortal sin is like a walking corpse. He's like a dead person. His soul is black, dead. Why wait to clean the soul and to regain the state of grace? You make an act of perfect contrition, but you never know for sure if it was really good enough. So go to confession as soon as possible. May a person... Oh, excuse me, we already mentioned that. What is the firm purpose of sinning no more? We said that true contrition is sorrow for our sins with the firm purpose of sinning no more. The firm purpose of sinning no more is the sincere resolve not only to avoid sin, but to avoid as far as we can the near occasions of sin. Now, we have already spoken in the past in the first section of the Catechism on what we mean by a near occasion of sin. Remember that a near occasion of sin is any person, place, or thing that easily leads you into sin. Now, let's give an example. Supposing that a person reads bad books, and when he reads those bad books, he nearly always commits mortal sins, maybe in thought or maybe even in action. And then he goes to confession and says, I'm sorry for my sins, and I'm resolved not to commit them again. Is that good enough? No, there's still something else. He has to be resolved not to read those books again. In other words, it's not enough to be sorry for sin and sorry and, and resolve not to commit the sin again. We also must be resolved, as far as we can, to avoid the occasions of sin, the persons, the places, or the things that lead us into sin. If we don't have that resolve, then our sorrow is not good enough or our purpose of amendment is not good enough. Can a person have a true purpose of amendment and yet fear that he will sin again? Yes, a person can have a true purpose of amendment and yet have a fear that he will sin again. But such a person should take courage in the realization that God will never fail to give him sufficient grace to avoid sin. In other words, we know we're weak. We go to confession, we really mean it. We're sorry for our sins, we're resolved not to commit them again, but there's this lingering thought in the back of my, our mind, I'm weak and maybe I'm going to fall. And then we think to ourselves, well, if I am afraid that I might fall, maybe then I'm not resolved. Well, yes, you're, you're resolved, it's just that you're aware of your weakness. So as long as we have that resolve, however weak we are, the resolve is, not, is good enough as long as it's firm. What purpose of amendment must a person have if he has only venial sins to confess? If a person has only venial sins to confess, he must have the purpose of avoiding at least one of them. At least one of them. If a person has only venial sins to confess, it is sufficient to have the purpose of not committing them so frequently in the future, to cut down on the number of venial sins, or to overcome completely one of them. And so this is very important for persons who do not have moral sins to confess in the confessional, not to fall into the routine simply because they do not have mortal sins of going into the confessional and uh, confessing their venial sins with a haphazard or a hazy resolution. We have to have the firm purpose of amendment, at least for one of them, always with our confessions to improve ourselves spiritually. That's the purpose of confession. We are weak. We need to go to confession over and over again, but still, when we do go to confession, we have that firm purpose of amendment. So keep in mind, then, the tremendous importance of sorrow for sin. Our sorrow for sin must be interior, supernatural, supreme, and universal. There are two kinds, perfect and in imperfect. Always try to have both of them, especially perfect contrition. And if ever you fall into mortal sin, remember to make a perfect act of contrition at once, as best you can, and then go to confession as soon as possible. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.